welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. MacroHive helps educate investors and provide investment insights for all markets from crypto to equities to bonds. For our latest views, visit macrohive.com. So greetings and welcome, Gene. It's great to have you on the podcast show. Thank you. Well, Gene, I mean, first, before we go into the, the meat of our conversation, I do like to ask my guests something about their background so it'd be great to learn about where you went to university, what you studied. Was it inevitable you'd end up in economics and finance as a, as a career? Uh, so tell us something about your, your origin story. Uh, sure. Uh, I was born and also grew up in Shanghai. And I went to Beijing uh, for college uh, in the, uh, the mid and the late 1980s. Uh, it was quite a different time. Uh, back then, uh, in fact, we didn't really have uh, the standard uh, Western uh, economic textbook. So basically, we translated one textbook uh, from English to Chinese by ourselves. Uh, so basically, we studied the, the, the book and do the translation throughout the semester. So that's how we studied economics uh, back then. Wow, and so it's like double, double the work almost. You have to kind of do <laughs> right. the translation as well as the uh, getting the yeah. economics done. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, after that, I went to the, uh, the U.S. Uh, for graduate school. Uh, I taught in college uh, for a few years and went back to Beijing uh, in 2003, 2008, uh, working for uh, mostly for city securities. And then I went back to the States again in 2009 uh, before the current job at IIF. I was with... Uh, RSI group uh, as a China analyst, now it is part of our ISI uh, Evercore. And I also worked uh, for Tudor Investment uh, Macro Hedge Fund uh, for about six years. Okay, great. And, uh, you know, I mean, what, what led to your interest in economics in the first place? I mean, sounds like early on you were quite set on this economics path. Yeah, that's probably the easiest question to answer for this hour. Uh, yeah, China just opened its door in the late 1970s. We can see the sharp contrast uh, of, of the Chinese economy back in the uh, 70s and 80s and the much more advanced uh, Western world uh, back then. So I think it's a, a question on everybody's mind. So what happened to us? <laughs> so, right, yeah. So, why the gap of a living standard is so big uh, back then. So what can we do better? So that, I think it's on, on everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. So I think the uh, people's uh, effort, uh, I think it paid off. Uh, so yeah, that translated into a very rapid growth uh, in the past 30 years. And then you, you on, the, on the job side, you worked for research companies, then you also worked for Tudor, you know, uh, a hedge fund. I mean, so what was that experience like doing research at, at um, you know, at, on the investor side? Yeah, so uh, in, in fact, I can boast a little bit. I uh, among the, the few people that worked um, both on buy side and sell side, uh, both within China and outside of China. Uh, yeah, so uh, that can help to bring a different perspective uh, on things. Yeah, of course, it's a very different. Uh, when you work for a hedge fund, uh, your research is very uh, trading driven. So on, on a whiteboard in the office, we have uh, some, somebody wrote, it, what's a trade? Uh, whatever, yeah, you, you do analysis in to put in, uh, at, at the end of the day, you need to come up uh, with a trading idea. Uh, so, Back in that time, so that's about, uh, say, 10 years ago, uh, most of China trade was still the tangential trade because the market access was not as easier as these days. So they were still mostly at the $8 Brazil and, uh, and commodity. So right now, market is a lot more wider and uh, open. So the uh, market access is a lot easier right now. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and so if we move to to today, and there's obviously a big focus on China's recovery. So the lockdown got lifted towards the end of last year, there's a recovery story. There's a lot of debate amongst investors around how strong the recovery is. Some people say it's weak, some people say it's strong. I mean, how would you characterize the the uh, the reopening and the, the strength of the Chinese economy right now? 
Yeah, I think the economy is well it's on its recovery path. Uh, initially, the, uh, the recovery seems a little bit wobbly, uh, I think for two reasons. First of all, you can see some uh, the signs was not very uh, reassuring because, because of, wow, uh, the CPI, PPI was uh, really low. Uh, I think CPI was 0 0.7 for both headline and the core, and the PPI was negative, uh, negative for uh, consecutively five months, uh, uh, in the past five months. It was, I think, negative 2.5 uh, in March. So some people are calling for uh, uh, deflation uh, in China. So if you are recovering, how come the economy is in such an almost deflationary uh, state? And that because of the uh, very low CPI, PPI, copper, copper profit is very poor. Uh, I think it's down about 20% year over year uh, for industrial firms. Uh, so that's why of initial uh, rebound uh, in the local stock market, uh, since the stock market is also very wobbly. So, so this makes people uh, very uh, unsure. Then the, um, the March data uh, for um, GDP and other activities are surprised on the upside, especially uh, of export growth. So, um, so that's why it makes people very confused. And um, I think I can explain uh, such a, a seemingly contradictory uh, um, data. I think what happened is that uh, China's recovery path probably is very different from what the, the, uh, we saw those in, in the States and uh, or maybe also in the UK. That is because most of stimulus uh, uh, put out uh, in the US and Europe went to the households. So you can see very strong uh, consumption rebound uh, uh, once people receive the stimulus check. And uh, that also pull up uh, the uh, inflation. We also have a, a supply shock uh, because of the war and the energy price. They see a very high inflation. Uh, in China's case, I think um, the stimulus almost entirely uh, went to uh, businesses, especially small businesses. Um, with very little uh, went to households. So yeah, households did save some money because they didn't buy much many homes uh, in, in the past two years. They did put a lot of money aside, but they didn't receive uh, this a stimulus check. Um, then all the sub subsidy went to the, uh, the copper sector create a very large uh, extra capacity. Um, so China is able to produce a lot. And so that's why uh, the PPI and our CPI are so uh, depressed and uh, they're not able to uh, make much money for the corporate. Um, so that is why we're seeing very depressed uh, price level and because of overcapacity. And uh, that also explains very large trade surplus. Um, the, I think the, the, the trade data is very interesting because uh, the people was expecting a negative 7% uh, of growth uh, of export it turned out about 14%. I think that is probably the largest um, an era uh, for economic forecast ever on, on record. Uh, so I think a part of it is also because of the large production capacity back at home. So this is able to supply uh, uh, the, the global demand. And actually, that touches on something which many some there, there was also a debate about whether China's reopening would be inflationary to the world or deflationary. But from the way you're describing it, is the larger issue is this excess capacity that's built up, which is just increased supply to to the world. So in some ways, it's a deflationary price shock to the world. That that's the, exactly the underlying story. Uh, there's no inflation pressure uh, from China whatsoever. So we expect a little bit of very shallow U-shaped uh, trajectory for its price. You may see CPI to pick up uh, later uh, this year, uh, but uh, I think it will stay pretty subdued uh, in the next couple of months. And so on the domestic demand side, if we split this into, uh, if, if we start with consumption, say, so what does this mean for consumption? Um, you know, is there some kind of, you know, people going to restaurants, you know, retail bounce, you know, that, that type of, you know, reopening type dynamic or not? 
Right, right now, I think what, what consumer data is also a little bit deceiving. Uh, on, the, on the surface, it's very strong. And the retail sales what, that was 10% um, year over year in March. But remember, uh, 12 months ago in March last year, uh, was the Shanghai lockdown. Uh, so, uh, so the yeah, the base uh, a year ago was really low. So I think the consumption was good, but not as good as the 10% number uh, indicates. Uh, right now, I think the, the server consumption is very robust. Uh, people start, start spending money. So restaurant full, uh, the damask um, uh, air flights, a railway ridership, they all rebound back to the uh, pre-COVID level. And I think the hotel booking for the, uh, the coming uh, May 1st golden holiday, I think it will be, uh, it will be very strong. Hotels are, are really expensive uh, uh, in the first week of May at, uh, of this holiday season. Okay. So for, uh, for the retail, and especially uh, the service retail are very strong, but however, people are not spending money on big ticket items uh, for two reasons. One is uh, the because of the very depressed housing sector. So if you're not buying a home, you're not going to buy furniture. Uh, the other is that uh, the because still very elevated unemployment rate. Uh, people are still very cautious about spending money on big ticket items. And then, so if you see, this is why you can see the uh, the sales of a mobile phone and autos are very uh, muted right now. Yeah, yeah. And then on on the investment side, then um, if we sort of break it down to sort of public investment, um, you know, state driven public investment, you could say, and, and private investment, uh, what's what's you know has that recovered? Uh, we see pretty, uh, well, I think investment is pretty going sideways uh, in, at, uh, at a decent pace, it's not as picking up strongly. That is because uh, the manufacturing investment has been uh, was strong anyway in, in the past year. Uh, the FDI, the fixed asset investment in the manufacturing sector was growing around 10, 11, 12% last year. It's already growing at a pretty rapid pace. Uh, given uh, the very cautious outlook of a global trade of export uh, this year, uh, so copper will not pour money into manufacturing. So things going sideways. Um, on, fix, uh, on infrastructure, uh, it will pick up a little bit, but not too much because local government are heavily in debt right now. Uh, in terms of real estate investment, that, that is about one quarter to one third of the total investment. Uh, it will be, say, a less bad situation. Uh, you will see, uh, you have remembered uh, the investment in real estate was down almost 30% year over year last year. So it will move back to, say, in the low single digit. What, look at it in year over year term, it seems a pretty decent uh, rebound, but you have to remember that there's a single digit growth at a very low level. Um, so this is not a, not a very uh, strong uh, growth. So that explained, uh, that's why China demand for, for base metal, uh, in fact, uh, is a little bit disappointing. It did, what China demand, um, commodity demand coming from the uh, green sector is very strong, right? Uh, the demand for lithium, uh, those things going into uh, EVs and batteries are very strong, but the uh, demand for base metal go to into the uh, infrastructure uh, and, and the real estate, they are not as strong as people hoped. And, and then on the real estate side, you know, that, that's obviously been a big focus for the last few years. There was a clampdown, seems to be in some kind of easing of some of the restrictions. I mean, how would you characterize, say, the, the official policy towards the real estate? And, and, and also just, you know, how, how much of a bubble is there in the real estate sector? Yeah, I think China's housing sector has peaked um, because we know for almost two decades, um, China's real estate is the single most important sector for the global macro, right? <laughs> if, you look at, if you look at the size, uh, the pace of change, 
its impact on commodity, uh, the change, uh, the impact on, on, on the downstream sectors is the, the, the single most important sector. Uh, this this uh, sector just uh, peaked. Uh, if you look at uh, China's uh, the household formation number, uh, the rural to urban migration number, um, they reached its peak. Um, the policymakers they came down on the sector really hard uh, in, in the past two years. They set up so called three red lines um, to uh, uh, prevent uh, the uh, developers to further leverage. Um, uh, in, uh, in the sector. Um, now the policy make almost backpedaled completely uh, of the policies that they put into place uh, in the past two years. But uh, I think it takes time uh, for the confidence to coming back. So I think at first we'll see uh, the sales to recover uh, in the first tier cities in Shanghai and Beijing, uh, maybe also down in, in the uh, per river delta, uh, but I don't think the home sales in the uh, poorer uh, province and small towns were coming back uh, as, as quickly as those in the, in, in the large cities. So from, from the sounds of things, you don't think there will be enough demand on the property real estate side to generate demand for, you know, base metals, the big, uh, you know, imports of uh, copper, iron, and all, all those that that whole trade that people often try to jump onto. Correct. I don't count on real estate as a growth driver this year. Yeah, and and when I listen to you overall, it it, it just sounds like there there is a recovery, but it's it's not that strong. I mean, it's 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 like a moderate recovery that that's happening, um, and it sounds like a lot of it is. Ex there's a big external demand component driven by exports, but on the domestic side, it, it doesn't sound like it's you know anything special. I think uh, the I think recovery continued to pick up pace throughout uh, the, throughout this year. So recovery uh, actually can be uh, backloaded. Uh, as I said, um, in the US, people receive the stimulus check, the spend the money consumption, so you have very sharp rebound uh, of the, uh, of the reopening. In China's case, uh, it, the, the recovery will be more gradual. Uh, it will accelerate throughout this year. So actually we do expect uh, a GDP growth in, in high five uh, uh, for 2023. Now, sounds a very high number, Remember, it was only 3% last year, right? If you do the moving average, if you do the average, two-year average, it's still growing at about, uh, probably still a little bit below the potential. Uh, because there was a large debate in the past two years, where is the potential growth rate for China? Uh, many people believe that given the high debt level, the aging demographics, uh, China's growth potential has lowered uh, permanently. Um, I think it's lowered, but I think it's probably still at around 5% rather than 2 or 3% uh, in terms of China's uh, potential growth rate. So for example, when China was growing at a, say 5 or 6% uh, pre-COVID or in say 2021, um, you do not see um, very strong inflationary pressure. And, and, and when China is growing right now, let's say at four and a half percent, see in the, in the first quarter, uh, you see um, price are very depressed. Obviously, there's still a lot of slack in the economy. Uh, the uh, unemployment rate is still elevated. Uh, the youth unemployment rate in China uh, was um, 19.6 in March. This was shocking. So, so, so China have never seen such high uh, youth unemployment rate. And also, you know, the youth in unemployment rate uh, can be very seasonal. Usually it's a peak in July and, and August uh, when people, when young people left college. Um, this is only uh, March. So if there's a 19.6 in March, we should see this youth unemployment rate continue to climb uh, in the second quarter to move up above, above 20% uh, by summer. I mean, what's causing this youth unemployment? I mean, why is it so high? Uh, it's both cyclical and structural. Uh, cyclical, as I said, I think even though the economy, economy is recovering, it is growing below the potential. 
the seen by the, the job data and also the, the price data, so obviously still uh, below potential. There are also some, something structural, uh, that is uh, uh, the wage uh, uh, can be earned by college graduates right now is lower than those that can be earned by nannies. I'm not joking. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow. Um, so that's so that's why uh, I think uh, uh, two weeks ago uh, the the CEO of a waste management company uh, in the U.S. said, "Well, uh, it's much easier to hire an MBA to drive a truck, right, than hire a union workers." Yeah. 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 So you have and the same story in China. Yeah. yeah, and and in terms of the you know the backloading of growth. Um, you know, the, the reason you think it will accelerate into your end, is that just uh, a case of kind of like a pullback towards potential, just the natural recovery unfolding more strongly? Or is there a particular sector of the economy you think that will drive the acceleration into, in, towards That's a very good potential? question. I didn't explain that. Um, that was part of the reason. The other more important reason is the policy cycle. Now, recall that the party leadership, right, was reshuffled uh, last October, and Xi Jinping got his third term. Then the administration was reshuffled in March, right? So the new premier just came in in March. So he's in office for just one month. And the previous premier, Premier Li Keqiang, he was already a lame duck uh, in the past uh, a year almost. Right. He couldn't do much. And uh, so that's why you do not hear much about fiscal stimulus or monetary uh, easing, right, uh, in, in the past uh, year. Um, so when the premier stepped into office uh, from his debut in March, it seems he's a very practical um, technocrat. So we expect that there will be more uh, policy initiative coming out from Beijing uh, in the second quarter. So that probably uh, will provide more impetus uh, to growth. Uh, by the way, uh, the political bureau, I think will meet next week uh, for the quarterly uh, uh, gathering for economic policy. So we, we should uh, pay close attention what will come out of the political bureau meeting. Uh, economic policy. And, and in terms of the market implication, then it sounds like from everything you've described, um, it's unclear whether the, on the commodity side, at least it's probably more of a green commodity story, you know, all, all the electrification trades, lithium, cobalt, and so on. Yeah. But then, uh, do, I mean, do you think this is a positive environment for Chinese stocks in general, you know, as, as the economy recovers or, you know, is there, is there clear market implication or is it still quite hazy at this stage? Um, I think I think stock is waiting for a couple of signals. At the stock mm -hmm. uh, stock is, market is waiting for a more clearer um, policy pronouncement. Uh, it is also waiting to see when the prices uh, can recover. Um, we need, we need to see to recover not only the activities, but also prices. Uh, copper needed a pricing power. Yeah. And, and we haven't talked about uh, what well, we have touched on exports and imports, but in terms of the balance of payments dynamics in general, I mean, what's your sense of the current account? I mean, there's been a, this long standing debate around China that China needs to become a consumption based economy. And so in the long run, it should actually move to become a current account deficit country. Um, you know, but of course, recently, the trade surplus numbers have been very large, very positive. So we, you know, there, there's no evidence of this big sort of transition to, to that. I mean, how, you know, do you have a, a long term view on the current account dynamics? Or, or, you know, um, um, or are we just back to, you know, where, where it was before? Yeah, current account was very large last year. I think it was about $400 billion and more than 2 percentage point of GDP uh, last year. Um, now, partly it was because uh, China economy last year was very weak. So the imported demand was weak. And uh, partly because uh, uh, China was the, the main supplier um, of uh, working from home and uh, PPE products uh, during COVID time. Uh, and uh, then the 
more recently, China became the large export of a green technology, green products. Uh, I think in the first quarter, uh, it was for the first time, China export more cars than the imports. Uh, so that's a quite significant uh, uh, momentous uh, event. Uh, yeah, right. Um, the, we expect, we, we hope uh, China consumption can pick up, but the unfortunate fact is that in terms of income distribution, uh, the households still get a smaller piece of the pie uh, for the whole national income. So uh, it's hard uh, to see uh, uh, the, uh, the saving consumption trend uh, reverse uh, anytime soon. Um, now, that it, because even though uh, the house get a smaller piece of the pie, but overall, if you look at these uh, 10, 20 year um, horizon, because the overall economy is still growing rapidly. So for people who migrate from rural area to urban area, they still see their living standard improving. Um, they still see uh, the purchase of power uh, improving, just not improving as rapidly as the whole economy. Uh, so that's why um, uh, the households they do not explain, uh, do not complain as much as you would imagine. Yeah, yeah. And then on the other side of the balance of payments, the, the, the capital flow side, are there any interesting trends on FDIs or portfolio flows? Are international investors putting money into China? Has FDI picked up at all or not? Yeah, the FDI number, in fact, is quite interesting and also very intriguing uh, because of people expecting the inbound FDI to suffer uh, because of the COVID lockdown, uh, because of the decoupling uh, pressure uh, in both Washington and Brussels. But uh, the truth is that uh, the inbound FDI was incredibly strong. It went up 20% in 2021, another 9% last year. Uh, so I actually did a little bit of digging to see why the, this number is so strong. Um, it was not because of a reinvest profit. Yeah, because China exports so much in, 20, in 2020, 2021, and the foreign company was able to reinvest a lot of profit they earned through export. We took the, those number out. We only look at the real uh, inflow it was still very strong. Hmm. And while Another suspicion is that, well, it, is that are they the uh, Chinese own money uh, did a wrong tripping through Hong Kong and disguised an FDI? Uh, maybe because the Hong Kong's uh, share in total inbound FDI continued to rise, but that's not the only explanation. Um, I checked the number uh, coming uh, from Germany, and I also asked my Korean friends to uh, check the number in South Korea. Um, the numbers indeed of it was very strong. Uh, the FDI coming from Germany, from Korea, from EU. Uh, if you look at check the data from those sources, basically you can confirm uh, the Chinese data that was indeed uh, the inbound FDI was very strong uh, in the past two years. Yeah, I know certainly when, when I've looked at the European numbers, there's there's actually been a shift of German companies um, to shift a lot of production over to China because of energy costs. Um, yeah. You know, so so perhaps that's part of the explanation as well. Right. Uh, the Chinese policymaker from SAFE, they themselves also admit uh, that we are number strong. However, uh, in the past year, at least in 2022, it was mainly driven by a few very gigantic uh, uh, mega projects. Um, the investment from you know, European uh, medium sized, middle stands, and small companies, they are declining. Yeah. And then on the portfolio flow side, uh, you, you know, I mean, bond yields have been fairly stable in, 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 in China. So, I mean, has, has there been much inflows into Chinese bonds or even Chinese equities? Yeah, portfolio flow was very volatile um, uh, last year. We saw a huge amount of portfolio outflows uh, last year. I think the total portfolio outflows is about um, $250 billion at about half uh, by China's own residents and a half by non-residents, by, by foreigners. Uh, 
so it's not just foreigners uh, took money out. Uh, China's own residents also sent portfolio money abroad uh, last year. So people are scratching heads. So well, what triggers such a large outflow, right? Uh, I think the current depreciation was not a trigger. It is a result of the outflow. Um, so I think that it is still mainly caused by uh, Fed hike uh, last year, and to a much smaller extent due to the heightened uh, geopolitical risk uh, in. Russia, uh, Ukraine, and uh, Taiwan. Uh, I can give you such an argument. So if the outflow was entirely caused by uh, the geopolitical risks, as people said, China's assets no longer, invest, no longer investable, then we should see the outflow of both fixed income and equity money, right? The fact is that if you look at the flows by non-residents, by foreign investors, Foreign investor took out $93 billion uh, in, in fixed income money and put in $13 billion in equity money. Okay, so, so it's actually more of an investment decision than anything larger than that. So it is yeah. still mainly triggered by the uh, Fed hike uh, because uh, it, for the first time, uh, the US yield went higher than Chinese yield uh, last year. Uh, I think the uh, the the reverse is more than 300 basis points in a year. So you said uh, the Chinese own yield was pretty stable, while the US yield went up so much higher. Yeah, and then on on, on the FX side, um, you know, has there been any trends on the FX side? You know, outside of, obviously there's a broad dollar trend that drives everything, but is there anything specific to the renminbi that that you've identified as 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 interesting? I think um, well, RB was pretty volatile last year because of the dollar. But at the same time, you can also uh, have a sense that the PBOC um, has been more confident this time than back in 2015-16. Uh, they may intervene, they may lean against wind, but they didn't intervene at a scale as we saw in 2015-16, right? Uh, back then, they spent say $300 billion reserved to intervene in, in the market a year. Um, last year, they basically managed uh, the FX mainly through uh, the macro prudential policies rather than direct intervention in the spot market. So for example, uh, to uh, stabilize the RMB exchange rate, they may uh, raised uh, the required reserve on forward contracts. Uh, they may raise uh, a lower uh, the required reserve on FX deposits. Uh, they may adjust uh, the parameters for macro potential formula to allow more FX inflow. Because it's, it's through those kind of policies that were influenced uh, the, uh, the RMB dollar change rate instead of a uh, pouring money, uh, pouring FX reserve money directly into the spot, spot market. And, you know, touching on some of the, the, you know, the bigger hot topics, you know, there's obviously been one big um, debate uh, amongst investors and economists about um, the dollar, the role of the dollar in the global financial system. And it does seem like China is trying to create like a China renminbi block, you could say. There's, there, there was a deal with the Saudis in terms of re-denominating uh, contracts into renminbi. You know, China obviously wants to use their payment system, uh, you know, rather than SWIFT. Um, you know, what's your take on, 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 on that, those sorts of developments? Yeah, a lot of things are happening in this space. Uh, things are changing rapidly. I think the data just came out today. Uh, for the first time uh, for China's trade, the amount of China exports settled in RMB exceeded those settled in dollar for the first time. Uh, so okay. yeah, I think right now, I think it's close to half of China's uh, trade is set in the RMB right now. Um, but the PBOC, in fact, is also very cautious. Uh, PBOC is much more cautious on that front than the media. The media tend to run a lot of headlines. I think it's a um, headline grabbing, grabbing uh, stories. In fact, uh, PBOC never used the word, uh, the word uh, RMB globalization or RMB internationalization. 
uh, PBOC was only talking about to facilitate the cross-border use of RMB. Uh, they just uh, remove, remove the, some of the, the blocks to facilitate uh, the use of RMB. Uh, yeah, there are many concerns. Uh, uh, there are many incentives of PBOC to promote uh, the use of RMB. Uh, but at the same time, uh, for PBOC, they know better uh, than the people in the media, also the burden, uh, the risk uh, coming together uh, with a more global RMB, right? And uh, the Sinaraj benefit, in fact, is pretty limited. But with a more global RMB, it will be a lot more diff difficult, a lot more, more challenging to manage your monetary policy. Uh, when you have a large offshore RMB in Hong Kong or in other uh, money centers, and uh, it will make, uh, make the uh, exchange rate management a lot more difficult. Uh, so that's also very aware of those challenges. And, um, you know, the other big kind of headline grabbing story is the whole decoupling between the US and China. Europe's somewhere in the middle. Europe's kind of, it's unclear which, uh, you know, how, how they're playing this. But certainly from the US side, there appears to be bipartisan support to somehow contain China, obviously on the tech side, high end chips. Um, but more generally, there's this sort of real sort of big sentiment from the US to somehow like decouple from, from China. Um, you know, number one, what, what what do you think of that? You know, and then secondly, you know, does does the China does China itself have a position on on this as well? Yeah, some policymakers are watching the pushing decoupling on multiple fronts. Uh, we saw those in technology sector, um, and uh, and also there soon uh, in terms of China, uh, U.S. outbound investment uh, into China, uh, especially at the FDI investment to China. Uh, in terms of the uh, in the financial space, uh, we see that um, those money who are closer to government, like at the pension funds, um, they are lot become a lot more cautious uh, about investing in China. I think it's uh, I think just the day before yesterday, the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund um, announced the. Uh, will pull equity investment out of China and close down the equity team in Shanghai. Um, but at the same time, uh, the other large uh, asset managers and hedge funds, they are all, uh, still fully engaged. And then on the Chinese side, I mean, is China trying to, you know, decouple from the US or trying to build up its own um, you know, uh, on the industry side, it's reduced its reliance on the US or trying to not invest in the US in, anymore itself. I don't think Beijing has strong incentive uh, to decouple itself from the world because everybody knows China um, is the biggest benefactor from globalization in the past 30 uh, years, right? So they know how important it is uh, for them. So uh, that is why when the new premier uh, took his office in mid-March, in his debut talking to the press, uh, he made a very clear uh, uh, that is a uh, um, China will uh, um, stay engaged uh, with uh, with the whole world. So I don't think they have incentive to decouple. So they may promote some. Uh, uh, industrial policies uh, to have uh, to reduce the reliance, but these are mostly defensive uh, strategies. Um, if you cannot buy chips, you have to buy make your own chips. Um, I don't think it's something they really desired. It's something they have to do as, as a defensive strategy. Uh, in the financial sector, I think uh, they still, uh, in fact, still welcome. Uh, foreign investment and foreign uh, uh, businesses uh, in, in, in places like in Beijing, Shanghai. And in fact, Beijing and Shanghai are competing with each, each other, uh, try to attract uh, the global financial institutions. And, um, you know, w w one thing we are hearing more of is, um, you know, reshoring, nearshoring, friendshoring, you know, all of these terms. So, you know, uh, U.S. companies in particular trying to move production facilities out of China, you know, maybe to Vietnam, Malaysia, India even. 
do you see much evidence of that happening or is it is it possible because obviously china's built up this is this quite impressive infrastructure for production of whole series of different types of goods you know is is there this this is there much evidence of of french shoring across you know away from china towards uh the rest of asia yeah i think those uh policies will only make the whole supply chain more complicated um, it, I think it won't be able to totally cut off uh, the export from China. You know, if you look at the data uh, coming out uh, in the uh, past couple quarters, uh, China's export to the US uh, did decline in terms of uh, its share of total exports. Um, US uh, is uh, no longer the largest trade partner. I uh, think fall into the, uh, the third largest partner after ASEAN and EU uh, for China. And also China is no longer the biggest supplier uh, for US imports, right? China now fall behind, uh, I think China fall into fourth place after Mexico, Canada, and, and the EU as a supplier uh, to the United States. So you see that. But at the same time, China export a lot more to other markets, uh, to ASEAN, to other uh, Belt and Road um, countries, and also to Europe. Uh, some of this export uh, probably uh, end up uh, in, to the consumers in those countries. Some of it re will be rerouted uh, to the US, especially for China's uh, exports to places like Mexico. Yeah. So that's why we're seeing uh, China's FDI in Mexico is picking up strongly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's hard to untangle the global supply chain that's been built right. up and optimized. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, that's a change has become a bit longer and more complicated. Yeah. And and when people look out to kind of mega trends, you know, 10, 20 year horizons, people often uh, talk about India as being the next China, so to speak. Um, at the same time, India has this rivalry with China. There's this kind of competition between the two. I mean, how do you see, you know, the path of India and you know, China's relationship with India, um, you know, on, on kind of a medium term, high level basis? Well, in terms of China's relationship with uh, uh, the rest of the world, uh, I'm not well, not talking about only economic relationship, but the overall mm -hmm. uh, relationship. I think Beijing made an important pivot uh, in March. Uh, before March, uh, Beijing actually uh, was a very aggressive against all the other countries. Uh, sometimes it would have been backwards to accommodate the request from the United States, but at the same time, a, a very assertive, assertive against other places like Australia, Japan, Czech, Lithuania, um, India, as you mentioned, right? Um, I think since March, uh, Beijing made an important pivot uh, that became a lot more uh, stone-faced towards Washington. Uh, at the same time, uh, become a lot more accommodative and friendlier to other countries. The romantic relationship with Australia, uh, the, the Mount and the Chama offensive in Europe. Um, I think they will also uh, try to ease the tension with other uh, countries uh, in Asia. Yeah, yeah, no, no, understood. Um, and then more, more, more generally, um, what what types of risks concern you the most about China? Like what what keeps you awake at night when you when you think about China? Well, China facing a lot of long term uh, secular challenges such as uh, uh, demographics, um, aging, uh, the, the depletion of uh, ex labor in the rural area. Uh, China has very high uh, debt level. Uh, the uh, real estate can be no longer counted as a main growth driver. Uh, it, seems, it seems a lot of uh, uh, the low uh, hanging fruit um, has been uh, picking. Um, but at the same time, China is also working very hard to find the mitigating factors. Uh, yes, uh, the population is aging very rapidly, but at the same time, uh, at this moment, the retirement age is incredibly young, 
the retirement age is uh, only 55 for white collar female and 50 for blue collar female. Um, while the average retirement age is 67 in the United States, even though the life expectancies are the same. Uh, I think in the 78 year old, uh, the chance of life expectancy is identical to, the, uh, to those in the United States, while the retirement age is almost 10 years younger. Um, so later retirement age, uh, better education and uh, more sophisticated automation can to a very large extent opt to mitigate uh, the impact of aging. Um, to tackle the debt issue, uh, uh, I think is more difficult um, because uh, on the good side, um, China's debt at the same time, they also build a lot of assets because when, when, we, when people talk, talk about the debt issue, it's rather easy to, for, for us to talk about the liability side of things because you can put a data, calculate how much debt a country has divided by GDP. So, wow, uh, the debt of GDP level has risen, say, from uh, 150 to, I think, 270% now uh, at the end of last year. But however, uh, it's very difficult, almost impossible for uh, for uh, people to calculate, uh, to look into the asset side of the balance sheet. Um, yeah, China did uh, pile up a lot of debt, but at the same time, uh, they also built up a lot of asset side because of China, a lot of China debt went went to infrastructure, right? Uh, so. So that uh, did turn into assets uh, on the balance sheet. But uh, it's, a no, it's a no denial on uh, China's investment become less and less productive. Uh, so when you uh, uh, piling up those debts uh, without being very productive, uh, then the repayment of those debt can become an issue. So that is uh, uh, explaining why uh, the stimulus uh, during COVID time uh, in China was so timid, right? Because uh, they do not have uh, uh, that much room to maneuver uh, comparing with those uh, after financial crisis in 2008. Okay, no, no, so that, that, so from the sounds of things, the aging side, you're, you, you think there are mechanisms to alleviate that, the debt side is more of a challenge, and in, in some ways that could constrain um, policy and, and so on, so that's, that's more of a, um, a harder problem to deal with going forward. Um, yeah. Now, now, I did also want to ask some personal questions as well. You know, we've talked a lot, you know, a lot of macro here. Um, one was, um, you know, you talk about youth unemployment in China, but what advice would you give to people uh, who are leaving uh, university to enter the, the jobs market? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it's important to find one's uh, passion, stay curious. Uh, the world is changing rapidly. Um, in my case, um, I think what I learned in college and graduate school uh, and what I do right now uh, can be very different. Uh, you can really just uh, rely upon what you learn in school uh, to have a successful career. Uh, you have to stay curious, uh, continue learning and continue to find new things to tackle that make the, the career more satisfying. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and then, uh, you know, I did want to ask about books. You know, I, I love reading books and I'm always looking for book uh, tips. Um, you know, what, what are some of the books that really influenced you over your career? Well, the what influenced me early on uh, as a young uh, student, uh, in fact, um, uh, was the book, uh, not only the books, but also the books we were not able to read uh, in the 1970s and 80s. Um, back then, the, uh, now you can call it the conservative thinkers uh, was a extremely popular uh, in China. Uh, the young people was uh, very eager to study. Uh, Frederick Hayek uh, was uh, uh, fascinated by Reaganomics, uh, Thatcher's uh, 
as policies. Well, they, they may no longer uh, that fashionable right now, uh, but they were extremely influential and fashionable in China in 1980s. Um, when Milton Friedman went to Beijing, he had a, a lengthy meeting with the premier. Um, so I think uh, for my generation, uh, uh, Chinese uh, were very much influenced by those conservative uh, uh, oh, yeah, uh, Freeman, all the, uh, the, yeah, the, all thinkers. the big free marketeers. Uh, That's yeah. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very different time now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and finally, um, you know, if people wanted to uh, see your work, uh, follow you in some way, um, what, what's the best way they can follow your, your work on China? Uh, people can go to our website, uh, rf.com. Uh, our uh, research are most uh, available to our uh, members. Um, some are behind a paywall, some are not. And uh, we also uh, uh, try to stay active on Twitter so they can stay engaged with, uh, with people, with okay. readers. Great, I'll, I'll make sure to include the links on the show notes as well. And, and I do urge people to, to have a look at your at your work, it's, it's very, very good. So with that, thanks a lot for this really enlightening and wide ranging conversation. And, uh, you know, good luck with uh, everything for uh, on, on your various projects and work that you're doing. Uh, thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or if you listen to podcasts, leave a five star rating, a nice comment and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up for our free newsletter at macrohive.com forward slash free. That's macrohive.com forward slash free. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.